Welcome to Hindu Analysis, October 6, 2018. So today we are going to see all these articles. So the first article is India Russia sign 5.43 billion S400 missile deal. So what the article here is during the 19th annual India Russia bilateral summit, India and Russia signed a S400 missile deal. So according to this deal, we that is India is going to procure five S400 Trimov missile systems. Okay, from Russia. So we are going to procure these many uh, missile systems from Russia, which is estimated 5.43 billion dollar. And it is despite of U.S. warning on India by means of U.S. is putting sanctions on India if we are going to deal with uh, or if we are going to have transactions with Russia. This is what the U.S. says, right? So despite of U.S warning now we have signed this right so it shows our india strategic autonomy in its own decision regarding the defense uh, manufacturing and processing etc okay so during the 19th summit itself putin and modi have discussed about the bilateral and the global issues and Putin asks Mori about how the implementation of GST is rolled out in India because Russia is planning to roll out GST in their country soon. So now we are going to see what is this S-400 missile. So it is a long range surface to air missile which can engage up to 36 targets at a time and simultaneously it can launch 72 missiles. So it is one of the world's most advanced def defense systems and it hits the target which is 400 km away from the particular missile. So it is capable of destroying hostile strategic bombers, jets, missiles, drones which are the enemy's targets which are far away from the launching point. So if you see China was the first nation to buy this particular S-400 missile from Russia in the year 2014 itself. So now we are the second one and now Russia is also talking with the Turkey and Qatar in order to sell these S-400 to those countries also. Okay? Why we need this S-400 missile system means as we all knew that India is presented or located in a very strategic location and it is surrounded by a lot of threats like uh, Pakistan, China, etc. So we need to be well equipped against these kind of neighboring threats. If you see Pakistan, it has nearly 20 fighter squadrons and China, it has even 1700 fighters including fourth generation fighters. So amidst these kind of uh, threats which is emerging uh, near or neighboring to us, we have to also equip our uh, defense uh, sectors, right? So only our government is planning to occur or procure this S-400 from Russia. So it will significantly empower the Indian Air Force against any threat and it will tighten our uh, air defense capabilities especially along the 4000 km India-China border. Okay? So if you see in this picture it is this S-400 missile system and see how it gets launched. It hits the enemy's target which is far up uh, like 400 km away. So only it is S-400, right? And uh, during the same summit itself, India and Russia signed eight agreements regarding space cooperation, railways, nuclear cooperation, fertilizers and MSME sectors between India and Russia. That is the bilateral trade. And they also set the target that by 2025, the Indo-Russian bilateral trade should reach like 30 billion dollar. And they also during the summit agreed to assist, that is Russia agreed to assist India for the training for Gaganyan's project, which, which is the first human space mis mission project from India's side and it is uh, coming into force by 2022. So for that also Russia accept to provide the assistance. And they also agree to cooperate in order to implement nuclear power plants that is we already had lot of nuclear power plants in our country so among that Russia is planning to establish 12 more nuclear power plants in our country which is especially coming under the ambit of Make in India so it is to boost our Make in India campaign also and they also targeted for deeper cooperation in terms of new new and renewable energy nuclear technology and defense railways and the possibility of joint venture between India and Russia in building civilian aircraft. So these are all discussed during the 19th annual summit between India and Russia. And after the uh, meeting, they also attended the business summit. In there, they discussed or urged the youth of both India and Russia to work on innovation to improve the life of the poor and the needy people present in both the countries. So they urged for innovation, especially to be uh, enhanced among the youth. So this is also insisted during the summit itself. At the end, our Prime Minister said that the India-Russia relationship should move beyond the 
mere buyer seller relationship that is now we are having some kind of buyer seller relationship but we have to move beyond that and we have to develop some kind of new technologies in india especially in the defense sector this is also said by pm and what is the way forward here is uh, as we know that india has a massive energy demands because of a huge population but at the same time russia is very resource rich country so we have to make use of or we have to grab this opportunity in order to explore their resources to make utilize in our countries by means of this bilateral uh, trade between india and russia and india and russia also had a strong and reliable friendship which remains over decades and the trade between the two countries is also increased by 20 percentage in the recent years so this shows that how strong our bilateral relationship is so we have to work together for multipolar and multilateral world as well as we have to work together in order to reduce the terrorism or whatever the threats in Afghanistan and we have to work together in Indo-Pacific region and we have to participate together in forums such as uh, uh, Sankai cooperation BRICS G20 ASEAN as well as we have to try to mitigate the terrorism or drug trafficking which is a very a threat which is prevailing all over the world. Okay. So the next article is RBI keeps key rates unchanged. So key rates means the repo rate, reverse repo rate, bank rate, etc. So it is not changed. This is what the news. So in the fourth bi-monthly policy review, after two consecutive increases since June. Since June, actually this repo rate and all getting getting increased, but now for this two months, it is uh, the RBA doesn't change the rate. This is what the news is. So if you see the repo rate is 6.5 percentage as it is, and reverse repo rate 6.25 percentage, and CRR and bank rate. So uh, what is this repo rate, reverse repo rate means? Simply, if you don't have money, then you are obviously going to borrow the money from someone else. Similarly, if the banks or the commercial banks, they if they don't have money they are going to get the money from the central bank which is the RBI so the rate at which the RBI lends the money to these commercial banks right so this is what the repo rate okay repo rate but if you have extra money then you are going to deposit in the bank right similarly if these commercial banks have extra money then it is going to deposit in the RBI this is uh, the rate at which it deposit is called reverse repo rate okay so this is repo and reverse repo rate. CRR means uh, cash reserve ratio, which is the amount of money which each and every commercial bank should have with it. That is what the cash reserve ratio. It is different from the SLR, which is the statutory liquidity ratio. SLR is the amount it should have within its uh, bank itself, but CRR is the amount that it should have with the central bank. So this money, it gives it to the central bank and it is preserved in the central bank itself. Okay. So this bank rate, bank rate is also similar to the repo rate that is the RBI is going to lend the money to the commercial bank but for repo rate you need to submit some kind of collaterals or securities in order to get the money but in bank rate you don't need to give or submit those collaterals or securities to the bank in order to get the money it is a lost resort method so usually this bank rate is uh, higher than the repo rate okay so see here it is 6.5 to 6.75 percentage okay so also the RBI's growth projection for 2018-2019 year has been retained at the same level that is 7.4 which was uh, estimated previously. So the RBI also stated these are the threats to the growth and the inflation of our economy like the trade tensions which is existing or the trade war which is happening, volatile and the rising oil prices and the tightening of the global financial conditions especially due to the US policies. So these are all the threats to our growth. So RBI called this method as a calibrated tightening. Before it followed neutral, but now it followed this calibrated tightening of either liquidity or the inflation. That is, they want to arrest the inflation within the range. Okay, So that is why they followed these kind of, uh, that is they maintain the key rates as it is. So we all knew that the rupee has weakened like 74 per dollar, right? So why RBI is doing is mainly because of inflation targeting. So they now wanted to achieve this inflation targeting around 4%, which is plus or minus 2 percentage. They ignore all other aspects of our economy. They only just focused on the inflation and they wanted to keep it uh, around 4 percentage. So for that only, they just maintain the level of uh, 
key rates like bank rate, repo rate as it is. Okay, And uh, this could uh, enable the government to borrow the loans at a very cheaper rates in the run up during the general election. So the elections are going to come right. So for during that time, the government can uh, buy more money or uh, borrow more money at a cheaper rate. So this would enable that also. And it may lift the sentiments of the consumers and the businesses because the business season and the festival demands also kicks in. So that is this time, right? So what the RBA missed here is it only focusing on the inflation targeting and it just re reject or ignores all other aspects of the economy like our uh, dep rupee is getting depreciated, our debt is also getting pile up and as well as the liquidity is also getting crunched. So for all these, it also doing some kind of uh, mild uh, solutions such as easing the forest investment norms and mild intervention in the forex uh, market. So by doing all these things, it provides the solutions to other risks uh, rather than the inflation, other risks of the economy or the financial stability is uh, keep in check by the RBI by means of doing these things. Okay. So the next article is avoiding the currency basket case. So this article deals about the internationalization of our Indian currency which is the rupee. So what is this internationalization means for dealing or for having trade with any other countries we are making use of our currency that is what internationalization that means making use of particular currency for the trade with other currencies not the US uh, dollar alone okay so you are making use of your currency that is what internationalization of currencies so the rupees valuation is often a concern so the value of the rupee against the US dollar is always a matter of concern so if you see from the past the value of rupee is varied over the years like if you see during the independence it is like one dollar is equal to just three rupees and 1960s it is 7.5 and 1995 it is increased to 32 rupees so so why this value value gets increased or why our currency's value is getting devalued means whenever there is a change in the political arena or whenever there is an instability in the uh, country in a particular country then the economic arena is also getting affected like the wars with Pakistan and China during the 1960s and the adoption of the five-year plans especially needing foreign loans for our survival and political instability which was prevailing at that point of time and the oil price shock of 1973 so these all things contribute to the increasing in uh, value of the rupees against the US dollars so recently also higher oil prices as well as the FII outflows from our economy and ongoing US China trade war these are all things which contribute to the increase in the value of rupee against US dollar which is one dollar equal to 74 rupees right so always these kind of external factors influence or put our currency into test okay so between this seizure happening which is prevailing in our indian economy always the rba and the ministry of finance want to ensure the stabilization of our economy by means of doing some kind of measures like overtly intervening in the forex market selling the non-resident indian bonds conducting a sovereign bond issuance as well as it also try to reduce the dependence on us dollar so these are all could be the possible steps in order to make our currencies more stabilized as well as our economy more stabilized which could also lead to the investors not to flee from the indian markets okay so this is the more important point in dealing with the internationalization of the Indian rupee right so we have to reduce our dependency on the US dollar so that our currency is going to prevail in the uh, transactions in a uh, higher way so how dependency on US dollar must be reduced we have to reduce the dependency thereby we can make use of our currency for transactions with other countries right so how we are going to do this means formalizing the rupee payment mechanism that is whenever you are going to deal with any other country instead of making the deal in US dollar now you are going to make the deal in rupee alone okay so if you uh, recently also for Russia we are having this rupee ruble uh, that payment mechanism right so it is indicating that we are doing the transaction in our own currencies itself so this is what the internationalization's key point that you have to transact in your own currency and also you have to reduce its gap of the current account deficit so the next major step what we have to do is industrial growth should be a priority that is 
industry should be grown that is if you are having enough goods and services to provide to other countries then only the countries come to you and you have transaction and then you can give and transact between the two countries by means of the indian currencies then only you can internationalize right so in order to make the transaction first of all you have to have the enough goods and services for that you have to develop the industrial sectors this is what the second major thing and the third one is the formalization of the indian economy by deterring the black money in terms of currencies you have to deter the black money which is prevailing in terms of indian currency so that the white money in terms of indian currency is getting increased and transacted or in circulation we can uh, then it obviously lead to the internationalization of our currency so what they are proposing for the formalization means we should encourage the tax rate rationalization reform vulnerable sectors support a cashless economy in order to curb the black money and create effective and credible deterrence so these are all the uh, steps which is proposed okay so we have seen this tax rate rationalization right which means if you are going to lower the tax rate more people are willing to pay the tax so which increase the tax base and increase the compliance with the tax return this is first step the next one is the administrative agreements with the countries like uk and switzerland which can offer mutual tax sharing and this could also be encouraged in order to uh, make the tax rate more rationalized and the next one is the directorate of criminal investigation should also be given adequate training infrastructure and funding to do the proper audit cycle for income tax service tax exercise tax in order to expand the scope for the simultaneous scrutiny so these are all the steps if you want to make the tax rate even more rationalized okay so what the author proposed here is the internationalization of our indian currency is a worthwhile goal to aim for because chinese already achieved this goal chinese uh, currency which is the yuan it already get positioned for an alternative reserve currency in the imf currency basket if you see in this picture the imf recently admitted that is in 2015 it admitted the yuan into the currency basket so in 2000 only dollar euro yen and pound or that in that basket but in 2015 they included yuan so how chinese achieved this is by means of doing a range of reforms to ensure that the yuan is freely usable if you are making lot of transactions with your currency then only it is uh, getting promoted among all the countries and it is becoming internationalized right so chinese is doing lot of re uh, reforms like multilateral trades with other countries and institutions like the belt and road initiative recently and the aib bank through that also it providing loans to other countries in terms of the chinese yuan and the swaps which is the swap between the chinese yuan with whatever the countries which is having trade with the chinese okay so by means of doing all these reforms the chinese make their currency more prevalent in the uh, entire world so that it made its currency more internationalized so following the steps of chinese we can also doing these kind of lot of reforms in order to make our uh, currency more internationalized this is what the author suggest in this article so soon we are going to expect our currency also in this uh i am of currency basket okay but if you see in reality the indian rupee is behind in internationalization we are not yet achieved that why because our rbi or our central bank is adopting a gradualist approach not a sudden approach or a rapid approach so it just allowing the companies to raise the rupee debt off sore first and it is a simple or mild approach and enabling the creation of the masala bonds which is the rupee denominated bond which is available in other countries and allowing the foreigners to invest in rupee debt on sore so by means of doing all these things it is gradually trying to internationalize our indian currency so if you see in reality especially in recent days the rupee is currently not even in the top 10 traded currencies euro and all all those things are in top traded currencies but our currency is not in the top 10 and we are only having this rupee kind of transaction only with nepal and bhutan now and but if you see in the past that is in the history we are actually our currency is a multilateral currency before once it, it was a multilateral currency so how the author concludes here is internationalization of our indian currency is not a big deal because it was once already a multilateral currency in the past so especially during the 1900s to 1970s most of our neighboring countries are having their transactions especially in terms of indian rupees for example it is the our currency is especially in the 
uh, Indian Ocean region like Java, Borneo, etc. And the Gulf is also having the familiarity of having transactions in Indian rupees till 1970s. And the Ceylon, Burma, as well as the Sindh, these three regions which is coming under the annexation, they are also experiencing the same currency usage in their uh, territory as well as Dubai and other Gulf countries were also using this RBI minted Gulf rupees until 1966. So if you see here until uh, from 1900s to 1970s especially during the British Raj period the Mughals rupee is getting leveraged by means of this circulation of rupee by means of their transactions. So already we have internationalized our rupee in the past. So this is what the uh, author suggested here. So only after the devaluation of Indian rupee in 1966 after 1965 war we purposefully devalued our currency so after that only these neighboring countries switching to their own currencies for transactions before and all they use our currency only so already we have achieved that so for restoring the rupees multilateral nature again we must unsackle its usage as far as possible so the next article is Nobel Peace Prize winners 2018 who are especially fighting against the sexual violence. So the Norwegian Nobel Committee recently announces the two people's name in the Nobel Peace Prize. They are one is the gynecologist Dr. Dennis Mukweg and the second one is the human right activist Nadia Murat. Okay, these two people. So for what means especially for their efforts to end the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war and armed conflict. So during the war uh, situations, this sexual violence is speaking, right? So during that point of time, they are putting a lot of efforts in order to fight against those kind of sexual violences. For that only, they are now getting this Nobel Peace Prize. So this person, Mukwege, devoted his life for defending the victims and supporting the victims of the wartime sexual violence uh, people. And she, that is Nadia Murad, she is a victim of uh, that abuse by the Islamic State and after that she has the courage in recounting her uh, own sufferings and speaking up on behalf of the other victims also. So she became the face of the campaign to free the Yashidi people who are getting affected by these sexual violences. So these two people okay, are now getting the Nobel Peace Prize. So the next article is Augmenting Life on Nobel Prize 2018. So if you see the recent 2018 Nobel Prize for Physics, Chemistry and all, it all uh, surrounds especially on the evolution and the gender parity. So the first one is Nobel Prize for Chemistry. So it is mainly focusing on the concept of evolution. Okay. So if you see these two people, they are getting the Nobel Prize. The first one is for a directed evolution, which is to create synthesize, to create or artificially uh, synthesize the variants of enzymes which could be used in the manufacture of biofuels and pharmaceuticals. So this is one. And the second one is for evolu evolved antibodies to combat the anti-immune diseases and to fight the cancer. So these two are for chemistry. Okay, So this is majorly related to the evolution. So the next one is Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine, especially for the immunologists. They are the immunologists. Okay? So they actually try to enhance the power of our body's immune system to go beyond its natural capacity and it also have the capacity to fight against the cancer as well as to curb the further proliferation of the cancer. So this is for physiology and medicine. And this next one is Nobel Prize for Physics. So it is for uh, optical tweezers. Okay, So this laser is useful to study and manipulate very tiny bacteria and viruses and further you can uh, easily manipulate or study the subcellular structures such as DNA and little molecular motors which are normally beyond our sensory or physiological capability. So we can easily achieve by means of using this optical tweezers. So this is also for physics Nobel Prize. So one more Nobel Prize for physics it is for the methods to generate ultra short uh, pulses of laser light which is used for ophthalmology as well as in making surgical stents. Okay? So if you see the list of Nobel Prize winners, then you can easily come to the inference that it is mostly dealing with the fundamental forces in science as well as whatever the technologies which is reaching beyond our human physical limitations. So those things are now getting the phys uh, Nobel Prize, right? So they achieved all those things. So however, what is the major concern here is two of the six uh, prize winners are women, but though in physics it is the third woman who are getting the Nobel Prize and the chemistry it is 
the fifth woman who is getting the Nobel Prize. So it is uh, raising a concern, right? Because since its inception, it is only a very meager amount of women who are participating or who are getting this Nobel Peace Prize. So it shows that there is not adequate environment for them to thrive in these kind of technological as well as in the fundamental sciences. So what we have to do is we have to introspect our policies in order to make or in order to enable an environment for women to practice the science. Okay. So the next article is Johnson & Johnson faulty hip implants. The Supreme Court seeks center's response. So what the news here is due to the large scale and illegal implantation of faulty hip implants in the patients. So recently as of now 14,500 patients lives in India is in danger. Okay. So this is the major concern, right? So what the uh, news here is, a petition was filed to take action against the government officials who are cleared the sale or for the implantation of such kind of faulty implants without proper clinical trial. So whoever the uh, authorities who are giving the permission without proper clinical trial, they should be punished. This, so for that a petition was filed. So if you see the statistics, nearly 15,000 units of hip implants equipments from Johnson & Johnson were imported and among that 4,700 were implanted already and only 1,000 were returned to the country. So remaining 9,800 faulty implants, they are untrackable or untraceable. So this is a major concern. We don't even know where it is or uh, what are the patients who are getting these kind of implants right so it caused serious damage to the body and the spirit of the patients who are getting implanted so there are already a lot of persons who died because of this faulty implantation and uh, infections okay so what the petition also wanted is to advertise nationally about this faulty units implantation and their bodies have that is you have to make sure that the patients who are getting that implantation that their body is having poisonous content because of that faulty implants so it should uh, the government should advertise this this is what the petition insisted in the supreme court's plea okay so for that the supreme court now asked to set up a special investigation team of medical officers as well as uh, police officers to look into this matter and inquiry against the cdsco officials who are the central drug standard control organization so these people are responsible for clearing uh, to give the permission for such kind of equipments or the hip implants. So you have to start the inquiry against those officials. This is what's stated by the Supreme Court for that petition. So the last article is Alfonso Mango gets geographical indication tag, that is GI tag. So the Ministry of Commerce recently announced that the Alfonso Mango from these places like Ratnagiri, Sindhu Darg and other adjoining areas in Maharashtra this Alfonso Mango has been accorded the geographical indication tag. So what this GI tag means, it is a sign which is used on certain products that have a specific geographical origin and possesses the qualities or reputation that are due to that specific origin. Okay, So this is a sign which is specific for that particular product. So it also assures the quality and the distinctiveness which is essentially attributable to its original place which is defined in that particular geographical locality. So it is specific to that place. So we already have 325 products from India. Some of them are, uh, the first one is the Darjeeling tea, then Mahabalishwar strawberry and Jaipur's uh, blue pottery, Tripadi ladus. These are all the GI tagged products, okay? So if you give this GI tag to a particular product, then it will benefit that rural economy in the remote areas, which is possessing that particular unique skills as well as the knowledge of that traditional practices. Thank you.